Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This is Ray Lucia Jr., and I'm here with Joe Lucia, president of Lucia Capital Group. And this is the Managing Your Financial Future podcast. And, you know, today we're going to keep it real simple. And we're going to turn it over to the guys. They've got three key questions that every investor should be asking themselves when you take into context where we are at the top of this bull market 11 years running in. So we've been going 11 years. It's been a great run. We all know March 2009 was technically the bottom. And since then, we've just seen new all-time highs in the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P. We're just really concerned because it's really easy for everybody to think about. I'm just going to allocate my portfolio for growth because the markets have been doing double-digit returns. And so before you forget that you should have a strategy, we're here to remind you that you need to have a strategy, a plan that takes into consideration all your financial goals and let the goals drive the investment. Don't let the hysteria blur your vision. That's exactly right. We need to manage risk. And sometimes we think we want to take more risk, but then the result, if it turns out poorly, then we're really upset. I, I take it when, when I used to go to Vegas with the guys and uh, we play a little blackjack. If I want 100 bucks, I was ecstatic. It was great. I won 100 bucks, but it wasn't life changing. But if I lost the hundred bucks, I was like, "Why did I waste my time and energy? I could have bought something really nice for a hundred bucks." So you have to weigh out the risks in the portfolio. Anytime you're investing in the market, you have to have a time horizon. So yes, eleven years running. Could it be twelve? Could it be thirteen? Could it be twenty years? We don't know. That is really the truth. And, and nobody knows. And nobody knows. So the, the key is you have to have investments for growth. But you also have to have investments that'll pay the bills. So depending on where you're at in your life, what your goals and objectives are in terms of income you need from your portfolio, really depends on how much risk you could afford to take. So we're going to turn it over to the guys. And before you make a risky money move out of either fear or just elation with the market, there are three questions you should ask yourself first. What are those questions? Well, I'm going to turn it over to Johnny Dean and Rick the Professor Plum. Take it away, boys. It's been almost two decades we've been on this journey to educate, liberate, and help you take action so you may better manage your financial future, achieve peace of mind, and accomplish your life's purpose. This podcast reveals financial tips, strategies, and insights that will help you set your goals and guide you along the way to help you achieve them. This is Managing Your Financial Future, brought to you by the advisors at Lucia Capital Group. I'm your host, Johnny Dean, with our own Rick the Professor Plum, Chief Financial Planning Officer. All right, we welcome you to the podcast. Johnny Dean, Professor Rick Plum from Lucia Capital Group. Where else would we be from? Of course, that's where we're from. Um, Wanted to get into... Hey, Professor Plum, do you know in... Well, let's see, from, from, from the day of broadcast... We're not that far away. I don't know when people are actually listening to this, but we're not that far away from where we sit uh, to, to, to an 11 year anniversary. Yeah, coming up, or maybe behind us by now. But, it may uh, very well be. March 9th. Uh, the great bull market. Uh, <laughs> or the end of the financial crisis bear market. <laughs> that's, that's really what it was of 2009. That was, this, is, this is the 2009 rally. This is the bottom of the great recession. Or that was that day. Yeah, the actual recession didn't end for another. I don't know year. I, I don't. I don't have the stats. But the it bottom, matter, according but. to the market. Yes. Yes. Was March 9th, two thousand nine. And Professor Plum, March 9th, two thousand. What happened on March eighth, two thousand nine, that caused this big turnaround to begin? I can't even remember what day of the week March 9th was. The answer, of course, is <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Well, I remember that the week before that particular, you know, bottoming effect. A lot of the pundits, some of the big, big names, you know, the crazy ones on TV that are fun to watch. All right, yeah. you know what? You get out of the market. We don't no end in sight. Get out, get out. They were they were talking about there's nothing that's going to signal a recovery. Yeah, now, okay, I've been, I've been telling you to hold on, but now I'm telling you to get out. Yeah, where were these people? You know, in 2000, whenever it started going down, October of 2007. That's when they should have told you to get out. So obviously, people telling you to get in and get out of the market is ridiculous. Nobody's going to tell you to get in when Timing, you're supposed yeah. to get in. No one's going to tell you to get out when you should have gotten out. So so that's the uh, that's the thing here now th- this is uh, th- the fact that the bull market is now 11 years old roughly 
and I'm assuming that it's still, by the time you folks are listening to this, it's still going on. Um, this has given more than a few investors this sort of mistaken idea, I think, that stocks are going to continue to climb forever. I mean... Well, you can look at it either that this is a new paradigm, heard that one before about yeah. 20 years ago, uh, or you could look at it, it's so long, it has to go down. Yeah, you, know, you, you people I've seen rationalizing the bull market are saying they're either this is going to continue because there's nothing to stop it, or it's got to stop because it's 11 years old and this is too long. Well, and neither one of those explanations really flies because I was back, I, I was looking in the archives in 2014, I think it was that they said, well, this bull market's about over. I mean, there and they listed 20 reasons <laughs> or something why, and they all seemed like plausible reasons. It didn't end. Well, and so the idea that it's a bull market of 11 years. It, we come into some very tight semantic issues in that you know, a, a bull market is a bull market until we have a 20% downturn from the previous high. Which we almost did. What, we were 19.9 something percent on the S&P. We were like within four or five points of a bear market, yeah. but we didn't quite reach it, so this is still the longest running bull. I wonder what would have <laughs> happened if I wonder what happened if we'd actually gone over the 20% and it would have officially ended and then they, they would have said we're in. Then people wouldn't have been as worried about this being 11 years old. <laughs> Or it would have continued on the way down. I don't know. That's a, what I want to focus on, though, of course, because this is a, a – uh, the podcast is called Managing Your Financial Future. But it could also, in some instances – be called managing your financial behavior, <laughs> which I realize sounds a little scolding. It sounds a little, I don't know, high and mighty. I don't mean it to sound that way. But as financial pro- a financial professional, pro- uh, Professor Plum, you, in some instances, have to act as a behavior coach or a behavior modification person. Oh, when much. people see and they look at the bull market, and they, they may either say, and this happens on both the top markets and when the market is completely in the tank, like it was in 2009, they either want to jump all in because it's about time, or they want to jump all out because the markets are never going to come back. And if they're making their decisions based on where the market is today and where they think it's going to be in the not-too-distant future, they're making the decisions based on the wrong decision-making criteria. Well, it is. They (laughs) they have names for that. Recency bias, confirmation bias, all this other stuff. There are psychological names for it. You should have a reason for what you're doing with your money, and the reason has to be you know, driven by time. Yeah, and I was actually speaking with somebody earlier today. They they have a portfolio of X amount of dollars, and they're going to need all of the portfolio within the next year. Um, hmm. It's not a huge portfolio. This one particular area, and so they you know they're going to need half of it in the next two months, and they believe they're going to need the other half of it within six months after that. And it's right now currently a hundred percent in growth style mutual funds. <laughs> and I said, well, you probably want to just, you know, take the whole thing and put it into a safer investment now if you're going to need it. Well, why would we want to do that? Because, it, well, because you're protecting yourself against a downturn. If if, if you're, you're going to take it and only half it's left anyway, even if it goes up by five, six, seven percent, it's not going to make a big difference in their life. But if it goes down by 20 or 30 or 40 percent, that's a big issue. You know, I'm glad you said that because this brings us to, to the, the, the crux of this situation that I want to talk about here on this episode of the, of the podcast. Um, some people who believe this market is going up forever. Let's stick with that because it's, okay, it's we'll 11 years there. old, and we'll start with this premise. And so I, I, you may have seen it. You may have seen less of it because you're an advisor and you deal with people who, who maybe are a little bit more open. willing, <laughs> open to listen to what you have to say. But there are people out there who are saying, okay, I, I mean, obviously it's going up forever, and or at least for the next 10 years. I, I'm going to start taking my money, and I want to, I want to roll the dice. Okay. Now, do you you need to spend any of this money in the next 10 years? Well, that's one of the questions you should be asking. Oh, definitely. But but, uh, somebody might say, well, yeah, I need it in two years. Okay, then you're gambling. Well, somebody may say, I'm not. Now, oh, no, they're, they're, you they may are. say it, but you can also say, you know, you're not crazy. Okay, but you so, are. <laughs> so there are three questions. And I, I should credit Michael Kitsis with this because I, he was talking about this, something very similar, I think, on his podcast or one of the uh, articles that he'd written on this. And I found this fascinating. I think you would agree with this. Let's say somebody is just dead set. They want to, they say, I, I, there's a, this goes off my strategy, but I want to invest in XYZ. I don't care if it's a company or, or a project. Or but whatever. it's growth oriented. But it's growth oriented, and 
you look at it and you say, well, there's risk involved. Now, which there would be with anything growth oriented. So three questions you should be asking yourself before you do this. You tell me you can comment and tell me if you agree. And I think you will. Number one, ask yourself this question. If you make this investment and it works out the way you think it will, like it'll be gangbusters, how will your life be different? the only thing really i mean a lot of people would do it that way because it'll make them feel better about being right yeah but will they be able to retire five six eight years earlier will they it's Uh, unlikely i mean over a one-year period of time usually even a 20 percent return you know doesn't affect people that much i mean it helps obviously it helps if we only knew when they were going to happen no but let's say you you were i don't want to say stupid but let's say you had a million bucks and you put it in some high flyer and it went up 20 percent over the next year Uh because you guessed right so you know what do you have now 1.2 million it's not bad all right so that would be answering that question if it works out in your favor and it, it works everything works perfectly Will it change your life that much for the better? Here's a second question you should ask yourself. On the other hand, if you make this decision, this investment decision, the risky decision, and you're wrong about how you think it's going to turn out, how would your life change? Well, Professor, this is where the answer gets really telling. That's where it becomes problematic. We saw this, unfortunately, a lot in 2006, 7, 8, where people were looking to retire maybe towards the end of the decade at that point, 2009, 2010, give or take. And they wanted, you know, they were just pushing the gas pedal trying to get a little bit more out of the market because they knew that ah, it's not going to crash before i retire i'm going to get i'm going to get that 10 15 20 percent bump and i'll be able to have that extra 20 percent and then 2008 2009 or early 2009 happened and their million dollars instead of being a million 250 was 550 six hundred thousand dollars and now they can't afford to retire when they wanted to. Unfortunately, they may have lost their job, too, at that point. A lot of people did. But even if they had not lost their job, they didn't have the money to retire, and they are no longer in charge of their financial future. And that will change your life. Well, yeah, because they had to keep working or doing whatever they had to do or change their retirement strategy. Right. So think about this. Just these two questions. There's a third, third question coming up, too. But you say, okay, I got to. I want to take this money, and I, I want to make this fairly risky investment because I think it's going to just be great. Now, and and the if problem you make is they this, do it with a big chunk of their portfolio instead of like a five well, sure. percent portfolio. Well, sure. I just gave an example of a million dollars. You yeah. know, somebody who has two million, they're taking half or whatever it is. Uh, so if you make this investment and it turns out to be exactly as good as you think it is, your life will be a little better, but it won't be gangbusters. But if you make this decision and it turns out wrong, it could ruin you financially. Oh, so it could really have a significant impact on your financial and your emotional well-being. Well, that's right. And I think there are some people who, after that second question, if they ask themselves that second question, they may actually pause and say, hmm, maybe it's not such a good idea to stray off of my my plan. Well, no, the plan does usually have some money invested for growth, but it's not money we need to worry about in the short run of the market. Short run being five to ten years. Sure. Some money. That's some fine. Some money you got to have out there to outpace inflation. Of course, but you don't want to stray off of that plan. The third question you should ask yourself before you throw all your money into some risky investment is this. Have there ever been times in your life where you were absolutely certain of a particular outcome, but then it just didn't happen? Oh, I've always been able to predict the future with complete (laughs) clarity, 100% certainty, and it always works out just as I expected. You know... Uh, Said no one. No. No, of course not. (laughs) How many times does that happen? Oftentimes, the, the, the outcome that you're predicting, whether it's good or bad... Almost never is a hundred percent true. Well, no, you can come close, and sometimes you feel like you, yeah, hey, did a pretty good job on that one. You might, but generally, the reasons are not why you thought that it was going to happen. <laughs> well, no, and I try to tell people who who worry about everything. You know, I know people who just uh-huh. they go through fifteen scenarios. Okay, what if this happens? I'll be prepared, and and they drive themselves crazy. And I say, look, you can try to predict what's going to happen, but how many times have you been wrong? Almost every single time, you're not clairvoyant, and you're going to be wrong. To some degree. At some point, yeah. To some degree about what's going to happen. So if they think about this and they say, gee, okay, how many times I made a prediction and if I'm honest with myself and I I was certain of the outcome, but it it didn't happen. Well, um, you know what? (laughs) Uh, You've changed your life maybe irrevocably 
by making this particular decision, it may be a good idea to stick with your plan. Now, here's the thing that I, I you know, when people hire financial advisors or professionals, Professor Plum, there's an element of, you know, I'm hiring you because I think you can improve my performance. You know, if you're hiring somebody for pure performance, you're hiring them for the wrong reason. Exactly. And if that's the only metric that you're gauging them on, you're asking them to take a ton of risk. So, absolutely. So, do you see a financial advisor's role as more of more of a behaviorist, like I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast, than you would somebody who says, "Hey, we can let's try to get eight percent this year instead of six percent." Well, you're talking about the difference between a, a stockbroker or somebody of that nature and a planner. Planners are going to focus more on the risk management side. They're going to focus more on consistent, trying to get less volatility, but still get some returns uh, that are consistent with the goals and to be able to achieve the rate of return necessary to meet your goals. Where somebody who's saying, hey, have I got a good stock? I This one, this one, this is the one. You know, Pioneer Aviation, that's, gonna, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Keep it down, will you? Don't spread it around. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and so what that it sounds to me is you're acting more as a behavior coach because if somebody walks into an office and says, I got an investment for you, I can tell you this thing is I, I, going to go sky high, that person is only reinforcing somebody's behavior. Right, and they're not looking at what you need to actually have happen in your life. Right, so if you had somebody who comes in and, say, and says, hey, I read about this investment, I really think it's going to go gangbusters, I think we need to put all our money into this or half of our money or <laughs> all whatever. Half? No. I mean, your then go job, find somebody else. Your job at that point will be at least to try to modify their behavior. Right. And it's interesting because that's what is important, I believe. Now, it is fun to take a flyer on things like that from time to time, but not with so much money that will affect that downside no. or affect your life. Take take a few percent or whatever. I mean, you you that's between you and your advisor. I saw a 2015, I'd have to look at it. I think it was a 2019 Morningstar study that somebody referred to. And they, they asked, they had a list of 15 things that people, 15 reasons that a person might hire a financial advisor. Number 15 on the list was to moderate behavior. Now, to me. It should be a little higher, I think. I think it should be a lot higher. Because oftentimes we're our own worst enemies. Would you Agree with that. Well, a, a lot of people who, and there's different. Some people look at their accounts on a daily, maybe a couple times a day to see how it's happening. And generally, they're very <laughs> difficult to work with at times because they're so focused on performance that when we've had a year like we had last year, um, where anything that has any risk management to it may not have done as well as the, you know, just the market as a whole. Uh, well, you didn't, you, you didn't beat them. I was like, well, our goal is to beat them over time and in down markets as well. Well, that's we somebody who's not looking at the goal. They're looking at what's happens, what happens a day from now or a and, week and from a, now. And a planner is going to be more conservative than an individual portfolio that's going to be more aggressive. I've met people who say, I'm real diversified. I'm, 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 I'm probably over diversified. And we look at the portfolio and they've got 10 or 15 different mutual funds. And they're all invested in the same stuff. I mean, they're all the same. So they've got basically 100% of their money in large growth. I mean, so, and, and, and you look at the mutual funds and their top 10 holdings have a huge amount of crossover. So they've got a very condensed portfolio, even though they've got it spread across 10 different mutual fund families. Well, the idea is to keep your eye on the goal. The idea is to say, what were your goals to begin with? Yeah, I mean, I've just, uh, uh, an analogy popped into my head. You know, I like analogy. Yeah, let's see if this one works. Okay. Uh, <laughs> have you ever been whitewater rafting yes. or, you know... Okay, one of the things that these whitewater professionals that will go with you will tell you, oftentimes, professional, I've never had that happen. <laughs> somebody who's done it, experts, people who go with the crowds because you need somebody there. Uh, they okay. do that, huh? <laughs> well, what they will tell you is, even if they don't go with you, what they will tell you is don't fight the rapids, okay? Oh. Don't fight the rapids. Don't worry about that. You can't control that, okay? Don't oversteer. What you go with should the flow. do is go with it. You make incremental adjustments. Okay. Because you know you got to be somewhere here. You make incremental adjustments. You adjust where needed, but you don't push against the rapids and you don't oversteer. I'd heard that from somebody a long time ago. Makes sense. And uh, living on the coast, I've been caught in uh, riptides, and you can't fight the riptide until it lets you out. There's another one. And uh, then you don't swim back into the riptide. <laughs> You've got to go at a different angle. Because sometimes when you're fighting against, well, you can use the riptide 
tried to rip current example, when you're fighting against it, you can often be pulled under. Uh, oh, very much. And that's where people get in serious trouble. But 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 what am I supposed to do, Rick? Am I supposed to do nothing? Am I just supposed to, you know, just let this tide carry me where it's going to carry me? Well, you at that point, yes. You make certain adjustments. You wait for it exactly. And I, I and saw you have other parts of your plan to be able to handle what happens with the rest <laughs> of your life. You know, it's it's uh, it's an interesting analogy. But well, I think it works in this case. Um, John Wooden, one of my heroes, of course. Me being a UCLA <laughs> Bruin. Um, Who? No, I'm kidding. I know who he is. <laughs> was. One of the things that he said, and I, I've never forgotten this, was that don't confuse um, action with achievement. And I may, be, I may be paraphrasing this. In other words, just because you're doing something doesn't mean that you're achieving anything. Doing nothing is doing something. Well, you made a choice not to do anything. But that's actually, yeah, that's yeah. actually doing something. And so when you run into markets like you did back in 2008, and it's going to happen again, I just don't know when, I think it's better sometimes to just stick with your plan. Look down well, that's the river why you and have, see where you have to be. That's why you have a plan. Yeah. You, you, you have to have a plan to know why you're investing and how to manage, and like I've mentioned before, manage that risk uh, because you don't want it to negatively affect your life. Uh, but there are, if you're playing with the stock market, there will be down days months, sometimes years, it, will that downturn affect you with the way you've got it planned out? Now, if you're 25 and it's your 401k and you're adding money to it every week, every month, no, in fact, you want it to go down so you could add more money to it when it's down. There's a but, sale at pennies, <laughs> right? But if you're 65, you don't want all of your money no. in that situation unless you don't need the money. Well, it can be very hard. It may, I think it's harder in down markets, you know, for people to stick with it uh, because they're just, you know, you it saw is. it in down markets. I, I, I've seen it where uh, people, I've, back in 2008, early 2009, I had somebody, you know, look at it and say, you know what? I thought I could handle the volatility. I was sure that I could handle the volatility. And so it, my portfolio was 50% equities, whatever the case may be. Now that it's gone down, I, I know I don't need this money. I've got a good job. I've got another 10 or 15 years before I need to touch this money. I know that if I, I just can't handle it. I'm, I'm going to sell this off and I'm going to go to something safe because I can't handle seeing the negative numbers every month. They learned a lot about themselves. It was an expensive uh, learning experience, but they sold out near the bottom because they realized they just didn't have the stomach for it. Were they retired? No, they had 10 or 15 years left to go. They even made the comment, right. Rick, I understand I don't need this money, but I can't handle it. Well, uh, oh, oh, I mean, okay, it's just, was, certainly it's your, it's your money. You, oh, yeah. do, you do whatever you like, but then you have to understand that you're going to have to make another decision. They decided they weren't getting back in. Well, that was it, huh? And as far as I know, they've never gotten back in. They've stayed safe because that's what they learned about themselves. Well, they lost a lot of money doing that. They lost a lot. Uh, but luckily, they well, had a long time that right. they could say, they go, I understand I'm going to have to save more for retirement now. I'm going to have to. But that's, the, that's, I've learned about me. Hey, that's all right. That's okay. Just, you At know. least he had the time. Uh, we are out of time here. But I, I just wanted to, to reinforce these questions. If you need to learn more about them, we're, we've got a, um, I think you did a video or you're going to do a video on this, a Lucia Capital Group weekly video on these very questions where we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, just think about this. When markets are going high, when markets are going low, understand, I think, Professor Plum, the idea is know where your goal is. Know what you're doing and what to expect and will that expectation, both on the high side and the downside, will it hurt you? And if it's money you need in the next two years, five years, even ten years? It's a, a risky proposition to be a, all invested for growth. Exactly. And that's why you talk to an advisor like Professor Rick Plum. It's why you can give us a call. I'm going to give you our contact information in case you don't have it. You can get in touch with us at 800-644-1150. Of course, you've got the podcast. You can find us on our website, luciacap.com. We can at least go over your portfolio for you, have you take a look at it. Professor Plum will be happy to do that. He loves doing that. Uh, 800-644-1150. Talk to the folks here at Lucia Capital Group. Okay, that's it. We ran a little long, but we appreciate everybody uh, listening to the program. We'll talk to you again next time. For Professor Rick Plum, I am Johnny Dean. This has been Managing Your Financial Future. Until the next time, bye-bye. 
The information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice and is specific to any individual's personal circumstances. This material cannot be used by a taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding penalties that may be imposed by law. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. Its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Always seek counsel of the appropriate advisor prior to making any investment decision. All investments are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. This information may change at any time without notice. Different types of investments and or investment strategies involve varying levels of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy, including the investments purchased and or investment strategies devised by Lucia Capital Group, will be either suitable or profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investments may result in a loss of principal. Accordingly, no client or prospective client should assume that the presentation or any component thereof serves as the receipt of or a substitute for personalized advice from Lucia Capital Group or from any other investment professional. Examples cited are hypothetical, are for illustrative purposes only, are not guaranteed, and subject to potential federal and state law amendments. There is no guarantee that you will achieve the results discussed or illustrated. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is a price-weighted average of 30 significant stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. The DJIA was invented by Charles Dow back in 1896. The NASDAQ Composite Index is an unmanaged index and measures all NASDAQ domestic and international-based common stocks listed on the NASDAQ. An investment may not be made directly in an index. The S&P 500 Index is an unmanaged index and includes a representative sample of large-cap U.S. companies in leading industries. An investment may not be made directly into an index. The investment professionals are registered representatives with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, and member FINRA SIPC. Lucia Securities, LLC, was acquired by LPL Financial, August 2020. The investment professionals of Lucia Securities, LLC, are now affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital.